I have a question. How can I continue to function within anything that holds objectives and goals that are form goals, whether that be a work setting, an organization of which I'm a member, a family, a marriage, a country, I mean, anything at all. How can I function within a context that has form goals if I'm determined to have only the one goal of peace. Okay, we have to take a look at the assumptions in your question because we spoke just uh, very shortly ago about the inner and the outer are not different. Your question is asking how can I function I, a person, function in a context that has other goals. So you're applying that that the institution that you're working in has goals. Institutions don't have goals. Institutions are ideas in the mind that are projected outward. Um, situations, families, don't have goals of themselves. There is no objective um, society that's outside of the mind. There is no objective institutions or um, workplaces or families that, that have different goals than the self. There is only the mind that holds on to concepts, and the mind can hold conflicting goals. So that, that belief in personhood, that subject-object split that we've talked about, the inner and the outer being the same is, is, instead of different, you know, is a very central point in answering your question. Now, let's so, so you're saying the question really stands on making that distinction yes. between the inner and the outer. Yes. So the question is a declaration. Yes. The question stands on the assumption that, the, that there is an inner and an outer. Mm -hmm. That, for instance, that this workplace has goals that seem to be different than my goal for peace. And so there's a conflict here. It's not seen that that the institution itself is a is a concept in my mind. It gets back to the deepest level of that there is nothing outside of you. That that the world is simply a world of ideas in my mind projected out. And then I the mind forgets that it that it's simply it's one's own projection or dream and, and one perceives through the body's eyes and hears through the body's ears and thinks that it's a person in a world that is objectively different from it. That the person is the subject which has subjective ex ex experience and the world is the object, whether it's the world of my family, my business world, my community, my nation, my planet, my cosmos, and so on and so forth. That world is seen to be objectively different than the me, the small me. Mm -hmm. That the question presumes that. Now, that's this is very deep and it's very abstract and it's very ultimate. It actually contains the release. And if you can begin to grasp that, then you've got your foot in the door to being released from all conflict. To bring it back to what might be seen as a as a more practical level of I've, I'm working in a place, and I've got um, my boss is telling me certain things that I need to do, and um, I want peace, but there seems to be a lot of competition in the workforce and so on and so forth. You know, the Holy Spirit works with the mind where it believes it's at. So in other words, if the mind believes in separation, the mind believes in a time space universe. The mind believes in bodies. The mind believes that it is a body, or we'll say even in a body. The mind believes that it is a, a person that has characteristics, that is working, that has a job, that has a boss, we'll say. The mind believes it, it has a country. You know, it has a, a family, a community. It's it's made up this construct. It's, it's projected a construct, and it believes that it is the construct. It is the concept. Then 
the Holy Spirit has to work with that mind to help it see that these constructs, that these concepts are nothing more than concepts. They don't have any reality. And so the Holy Spirit works with the mind where it believes it's at. So, for instance, one starting out working with the Course is not asked in Lesson 1 to lay aside all thoughts, all concepts, all beliefs that one has ever held about the world. No. The, the lesson starts off with nothing I see means anything. It's a simple lesson of starting to um, detach from the meaning of things that the physical eye see. You know, a, a, a first glimmer of, you know, seeing is not believing. Or, you know, it's the, it's the old wives' tales about, you know, what you see is what you get. This a glimmer of, of the idea that um, there's something beyond what I, what I see with the naked eye, so to speak. So one could take the course and apply the workbook lessons and, and take an idea for the day seemingly as a person, seemingly into a work setting, for instance, or into a, a church setting or, or to, into the laundromat or, <laughs> or wherever one seems to go, and to use the idea to help loosen the, the, the mind grasp or grip onto these concepts and so it's just like a loosening of these of these concepts a slight detachment little by little and it seems to happen in, in segments just little by little so that in the ultimate sense when you carry it out and you hold uh, pieces your goal um, you will begin to detach from the ways of the world in the mind there may be form changes in, in the seeming lifestyle on the screen as well, but, but these will just be reflections from changes in the mind. It seems like there would, there would almost have to be form changes, that that would just automatically follow from and unfold from the changes in the mind, that as the mind loosens up, the form would loosen up. Yes. And if you study the life of Jesus, whether it's in the Bible or the Arantia book for a much more detailed um, study, if you study the life of, of some of the Eastern saints, you know, like a Meher Baba or a Ramana Maharshi, if you study the life of Krishnamurti, you know, from, from early childhood on and everything, this is what you see. I mean, when we say study the life, I mean, you can, you can look at the form and you can look at what what the body seemed to be doing, but really when we're talking about life, we're talking about the mind. Mm -hmm. You can study the teachings of these, these wonderful teachers, and you can hear them speak of the detachment. You know, the Buddha talking about, uh, you know, all grief comes from attachment. It's been around for, for centuries. The, the mystics have talked about this, that you can see in their life um, that we don't see Jesus having to deal with, um, when he's on his public ministry, um, with uh, a boss <laughs> telling him, you know, uh, you no, you really need to do this. This is our, this is our policy, a you know, business policy, our corporate policy. You know, you don't see Krishnamurti having to deal with um, issues of uh, of his family or his mother saying, "Oh, honey, I don't, I don't want you to do that." You know, and and him feeling very distraught. I mean, these are these are beings that that clearly begin to see that my mind is the cause of the dream world. I am not a helpless victim of, of circumstances and events and things that happen to me. And beyond that, I I am not a part of the world. I am not in the world. But the world is in my mind, and I can choose to give the world in my mind, these thoughts, another purpose. I can choose to detach from the from the ego's purpose, which is to use the, the world as a, to reinforce the conflict in the mind and to, to maintain the belief in separation. But, or I can, can detach and uh, forgive and overlook the appearances of the world. I'm the, I'm the dreamer of the dream. I don't have to answer to the dream figures because I hear only one voice. I hear the voice for God. 
the wisdom is really the recognition of who I am. Yes, there's great power in that recognition. Defenselessness and, and strength go together. Innocence and strength are attributes in the metaphysical perspective that, that go together. This is not so in the world, that one who is defenseless or harmless is, is seen to be a pushover or is seen to be one that will be just mowed over by the world. And, and a wimp. A wimp, victimized by this mighty external world. But to the saint, the mystic sees, of course, that the world is not um, this external thing and, and that I am not this little body in this giant external world, but, but it, as a matter of fact, this body and the other bodies and the world itself are simply projections, and there is no fear of projection in a healed mind. So it's a matter of being practical. This can seem very deep. This can seem very metaphysical. I assure you that as you continue on and you continue to step one step in front of the other and to follow the voice within and, and apply the principles, that this will seem very natural, that there is, in a sense, of the people-pleasing and the codependencies and, and so on and so forth um, of, of a mind that's very insecure about its own identity and needs these externals to so-called prop it up or to build up its esteem are no longer necessary. That all true self-esteem and self-worth comes from remembering one's true identity as spirit and, and disidentifying from uh, all the projections in the external world. Seeing the blocks for what they are and simply withdrawing belief from them, withdrawing investment. And it's really that simple. One thing we could go into is the whole concept of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I guess it's kind of a misconcept mm -hmm. of sacrifice. Say something about that. Well, to a deceived mind that uh, believes in the world, the world is obviously something. It's, it's something important. It has existence and it has importance. And, and if we get back to our ordering of thoughts or hierarchy of illusions discussion, that uh, there are elements, of, uh, particularly of the perceived world, that have more importance than others. And uh, anything that, that is a projection that has value to the mind, it would be perceived as a sacrifice to let something of value go. It's only the awareness of, of the lack of value of something, of the nothingness of some projection or something, that completely eliminates the, the idea of sacrifice. The, the Sacrifice comes in, in in the placing value in idols. And then feeling like that has to be forfeited yes. for some reason. Yes. Perhaps, probably. Well, I guess it's always for the purpose of getting something that's considered more valuable than what you're willing to forfeit to have that. Yes. The, the idol is seen as, as uh, having more value than this hypothetical thing called salvation or redemption or... Yeah, peace is a nice idea, you know, it's a, it's a utopian idea, you know, it's having faith, in a sense, blind faith in something unseen, like God, or the Holy Spirit, or so on and so forth, then, you know, it's still, the mind is still afraid of this light, it's still uncertain about the, the spirit, and it, it's like it's the form, the concrete, has become familiar and comfortable to it, and it's it's more um, comforting to it at times. It, it believes to cling to the old familiar, comfortable, than to what it thinks of the risk um, opening up to something that it's very unsure about and uncertain. So obviously, hand in hand with uh, with laying aside the, the belief.